Life with Liliana and Friends. Hola and welcome to Life with Liliana and Friends. I'm so glad you could make time to join us this evening. As you know, we are talking around the topic of greener pastures and we've been just listening and exploring different stories of Fijians that have moved overseas for work, or um, you would recall that uh, we spoke to my brother in the British Army, Aoki as a caregiver in the US, so those are two of the most common ones, yeah? But today, I am really, really happy that we get my old girl, Rossi Romboku, to join us from New Zealand. Bola winaka, Rossi. Bola Liliana, and bola to the viewers as well. Yeah, just listen to that energy. It's just like the same energy I remember from Sawani. You can hear this loud voice. I have to tell you, Rosie's got a loud voice and she was my junior. And so I can remember like in the dining hall hearing this loud voice that's talking when it's not supposed to be talking, but it's lovely to hear that voice again. Rosie and her husband, Jim, are based in Christchurch in New Zealand. And they have such an interesting story because they moved over when Jim was, Jim was actually a baker. So it's not a common story that you hear. So he was in Wainimbokasi as a baker and Rossi was working at BSP. Now, Rossi, we would love to hear the story of how a baker from Wainimbokasi and a, a bank officer, well, working for BSP, took you to Christchurch from Fiji. How did that happen? Thank you, Liliana. Uh, well, Jim and I were trying to explore uh, greener pastures while we were still in Fiji. The main uh, reason to that was as a, as a baker in Fiji, you'd get up to $3.50 an hour as the highest uh, hourly rate. And because I worked in the bank and uh, we decided that uh, it would be best that Jim get a better pay job. Uh, as a leader of the family, it's always best to earn more and be the decision maker in the family. So that was what started our dream and then we started exploring. And uh, at the same time, we were we had a plan to come for a church youth conference in Waikato. So we thought, okay, why not put in a visa application? And in the meantime, we were finding out how New Zealand was, how Auckland was, Waikato. And we found out that due to the Christchurch earthquake in 2011, the rebuild was still happening in the Canterbury region. And the Immigration New Zealand were giving out three-year visas. So we thought that, okay, we'll put in a visa application. If we get a visa, then we will go to Waikato, finish our youth conference and make our way down to, to Christchurch. But uh, Jim has uh, quite a story behind him. He was uh, convicted of uh, rob robbery with violence a few years ago, 2000, in 2000. So we didn't really know whether he would get the visa. So it was all part of our plans. We were praying about it, but uh, we were really happy to get the visa and that was where our journey started. And before leaving Fiji, we had booked our flights, booked our accommodation, and we were going to come to Waikato for a week. We were going to take a bus ride down to Wellington, and we had calculated that uh, it would take a three-hour boat ride from Wellington to Picton, but uh, we would probably need to spend a weekend there. And then we had paid for bus fare as well from Picton to Christchurch. So that was where our plans were when we got on the plane to come to New Zealand. It wasn't until we were in the church youth conference and we were contacting people and finding out like our friends, which part of New Zealand they lived in, whether it was along our bus ride route. And uh, we found people. So we found places to stay uh, in Wellington and in Christchurch as well. Yes, how interesting. It, it just sounds like such an adventure, Rossi. Oh yes, it was yeah. an adventure because we didn't really know where we were going to end up and whether what we thought through our research was really going to eventuate. But yeah. it, did. it did. There was a lot of uh, information available online and uh, yeah. we ended up where we wanted to go. <laughs> Yes, that's good. And another thing I'm hearing too is how you were able to stay in different places. Is this from fellow Fijians? 
yes, uh, most of our stay was with our friends. So um, uh, when we came down to Wellington, we stayed for a night at a couple's home. They were Palani and they we had met them at the youth conference we were at. Right. But I had contacted uh, Tima, our friend. Uh, yeah. yeah, so Tima wanted us to come and stay with her. So we spent the rest of our weekend in Wellington at her house. And then she right. dropped her us off at the wharf to catch the ferry. Right. I'm surprised you didn't get distracted staying with Tima for that time, that you just forgot what your... Oh, <laughs> you must was, have had fun. It was a sleepless uh, few nights, yeah. so we were obviously <laughs> talking from uh, midnight to midnight. Right. Just had to have a uh, two-hour sleep uh, before we were on the boat to <laughs> Because the boat was leaving early in the morning. Yes, you know, but I really like what you're talking about because what you're just mentioning is is how strong the network is for us Fijians because we have our church community that's such a big part of our life and then we also have family and friends all over the world. So when we go to different countries like this, even though the support network is not the same, we are bound to have someone that we can reach out to. Eh? That's what you guys found, which is why you were able to move around um, quite easily. Yes, that's very yes. Cool. yes. And so just before we go into a break, you briefly mentioned your husband's conviction. So I just wanted to ask, you know, for those who are in similar situations, because I think people just give up very easily. Like, oh, no, I've got a conviction. There is no way I'm going to get it. Just before we go into the residency, what about the travel visa, the visitor's visa? Was that difficult with his conviction? was longer because immigration um, said that uh, he didn't meet the character requirement for a visa, but they gave us an opportunity to explain. So we had uh, uh, just looked up the requirements on, on the internet and we compiled information to show that it was such a long time ago, it was like a bad decision for a young boy, yes. he's now a grown man, uh, his life has changed much. And we had a lot to show for that because yes. Jim had studied at APTC and uh, well, we were going to church together. There was a lot of evidence that he could show of how his life had yes. changed. So even I though, if, uh, you know, like if people have a conviction, it depends on what the actual um, conviction was for and how long ago it was. Yes. So you can still get a visa if... Uh, right if uh, you have been convicted, but yeah. the timing and, and the case also matters on whether... Yeah. Yes, and also what you've been doing in between that time is also important, yeah? Well, that's really interesting, and I, I, think, I hope that encourages somebody today that it's not the end of the world if you have a conviction and you're looking to go overseas, even for a visit. Rossi, we're going to take a quick break and we'll jump right back into this conversation. Viewers... Grab a hot drink or cold drink or whatever, but let your friends know that this is a conversation not to be missed. I'll see you shortly. Life with Liliana and Friends. Life with Liliana and Friends. Welcome back to Life with Liliana and Friends. We're talking with my good friend, Rossi, and she's based in New Zealand. She's been there since 2015. So, Rossi, when we ended, you were talking a bit about, you know, getting your visa, and we touched on your husband's conviction, but you, you actually know a lot about this visa process, don't you? Because now you are a successful businesswoman, and you own your own business, and you're really all you do what you do, you live and breathe this whole visa process, giving advice to people on, um, on visa-related issues or immigration-related issues. So can you please talk to us about that story? How did you get to where you are today? Uh, when, when we arrived, uh, well, after we got our visa, so uh, we had reached Christchurch. I went back to Fiji after a month. But I returned in December 2015 after I had my uh, open work visa as a partner of a, a work visa holder. And I uh, got a job with an immigration lawyer. She's a really good immigration lawyer. She has quite the reputation here in New Zealand. And um, as I started with her, she did our residence paper. So she helped us apply for residence. And uh, she has quite the clientele as well from different parts of the world, 
individuals, families, um, mostly companies who contracted to maintain the visa status of their staff. And uh, even in the Christchurch shooting, she was one of the um, appointed immigration lawyers that could help the victims of um, uh, the victims and their families who were affected by the shooting to get uh, residence. And uh, it, was, it was such an interesting process for me because I actually came through that uh, migrant pathway and I learned a lot while working for her. And um, in the process, the company, the law firm I worked for also sponsored my studies to, to study to become a legal executive. And that was a role I went on to hold at uh, the law firm we worked at. So I worked for her for four years. I, I really loved it, but the, the charges uh, for the lawyer is very high. So for a work visa itself, it's like $3,000 for one person's work visa, not even including the immigration application fee. So in the back of my mind, I've always thought and something that Jim and I have always discussed, we should try and look around for a way we can actually help uh, our families and friends, uh, the Fijian community that we have come to know here in Canterbury, uh, to help them have access to good immigration advice. But for this lawyer, you'd have to pay $500 just to talk with her for like 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, while I was still working for the law firm, I started studying this graduate diploma for New Zealand Immigration Advice. And uh, if I had decided to run my own business, I would eventually have to leave the law firm because I couldn't work for the law firm and uh, be a licensed uh, executive, uh, legal executive and also be a licensed immigration advisor. I could only take one of the licenses. But uh, my daughter had, well, my daughter was diagnosed with depression in 2020. And that was why I left my work to stay home. But also at that time, I had finished enough of the studies to be able to apply for my license. Mm -hmm. And then I just left home and applied for my license. And then I slowly got my business up and running. That is wonderful. I really love, one of my favorite things about what you spoke about was how you went and got, you know, started doing your studies to be prepared. Like I'm a big believer in not waiting, but then just be prepared because the opportunities are going to come. And the situation with your daughter is not something you expected, but you were ready because you had that, eh? You were ready. So what about setting up a business in New Zealand, Rossi? How was that? Was that a difficult thing to do? Setting up a business in New Zealand is really, really easy. You can get up one morning and get onto the internet and register your business. And a few minutes later, you're a business owner. So everything is done online and it's just like one process. So there's a portal here called Realme. And uh, you just log into your Realme you uh, put in the business name that you would like to use. So they run the name check and then they will tell you whether the business name is available and whether it's also available through uh, social media platforms. So it'll tell you, you know, like it's available on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and, and you can just choose it. Or if it's not available, you can look for another one and then register. And it allows you to register for the TIN number at the same time for the IRD number. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, and uh, you can do all of your director signing and all of that. And a few minutes later, it's up and running. Wow. And you have you gotten support after that from the government in terms of not so much financial uh, support, but, you know, just in guiding it because you would be a new business owner. Yes. Uh, initially, I, I didn't get any kind of advice because I just decided, okay, I'll set up my business. I'll spend the time to look after my daughter at home. Um, maybe I'll get two casual contracts where I can work while uh, I'm looking after my daughter. But then things uh, sort of just kickstarted all of a sudden. I was invited to uh, speak in a video for the Canterbury Fijian community. This was for the 50th uh, anniversary for Fiji's independence in 2020. And the interview was put on Facebook and the video went viral. And I wasn't prepared for 
for the calls and messages and all of that. So all of a sudden I was just too busy again, but it was towards sort of like um, December that year when things settled down and then I sat down and started putting my processes in place and then it was when I found out about the Pacific Business Trust. So it's a trust for Pacific business owners and you can get any kind of help from them, whether it's business coaching, financial advice, you want someone to look at your accounts, um, graphic design, marketing, anything. Wow. So I signed up with them and then I got referred to the Christchurch branch. So the, the operative here in Christchurch is called the... Uh, Pacific Business uh, Collective, so PBC. And uh, we have been meeting uh, every month and it's quite a good group because there's a lot of Pacific business owners and not only Fijian, there's Solomon Islands, Tonga, Samoa who run their own business and I found it really helpful because we can bounce our business ideas off right. each other and if something is not working for me, I can just mention it to someone and that person has done it already. And then we share networks as well. So it has been very useful in guiding the business, sort of. Yeah. But also during lockdown, when there's no one you can see, we still continue to attend this on Zoom and, and keep in contact with each other. Yes, that's fantastic. And I'm glad that we not only have access to it overseas, when you're overseas for support, but that you actually used it. So that's so good. We're going to take a quick break now, but we'll come back and talk more about uh, visa-related things after the break. I'll we'll see you shortly. Life with Liliana and Friends. Life with Liliana and Friends. Welcome back to the last segment of tonight's show. We're speaking with Rossi, who's based in Christchurch. Rossi, we were just talking, touching on your business before this and how you deal with the, I mean, you're an immigration advisor, right? So dealing with a lot of those visas that come through. My question is, you would have seen so many families come through. What have you seen that really helps people thrive when we're coming from the Pacific Islands into New Zealand? Uh, one of the biggest things that makes people, uh, you know, strive or well, achieve whatever they are trying to achieve, uh, trying mm. to achieve their goals, is uh, having the complete family unit here. So whenever I have to help someone, I always encourage them to, if it's only one person who's here, to bring their families over. Because if your families are here, you would know that there's uh, an age limit that your children can reach uh, to be on a temporary visa. So people will work harder to apply for residence before their children turn 19 or turn 20, because otherwise they'll have to start sending their children back to Fiji. Uh, and that's uh, something that I always help uh, my clients with. And uh, also it's just, uh, it's just general life overseas. Uh, we need to be independent, financially independent, because everything costs money and especially visa applications cost money. Uh, families and applicants, they need to set this money aside. And uh, it's not cheap. Like uh, a work visa will cost uh, $495. But if you're wanting to apply for residence, the cheapest residence application fee is $1,800. And most people won't be able to pay that like in one or two or three pays. So, uh, we need to just continue to save throughout our time here to be able to apply for residence and have the money to do so. And then paying for an advisor or lawyer to do that, that's an extra couple of thousands on top of the application fee. But even then, there would still be extra costs like the medical and, uh, and uh, police checks that uh, applicants need to bring. So saving is definitely another uh, big thing that families would have to do if they want to achieve their goals. Yes, that's a really good point because I guess generally uh, when we talk about uh, it okay, saving is not always part of our vocabulary. Eh? We know that. And so that's a really great point. Some of these things we're going to need to get used to quickly 
in order for us to be successful or for us to thrive. Now, one thing I want to ask you or your opinion on this. So you know how we say, okay, we're going to go across for greener pastures. I'm going to go to New Zealand because their minimum wage is, I don't know what the minimum wage is, $10 or $15, is it? Well, it's 20 $20. So all of you listening, I'm sure you're thinking, man, I wish I was in a place where the minimum wage was $20. But talk to us about that. Is that if you went and you were getting $20 the minimum wage, would you have a great elaborate lifestyle like we imagine you would? Um, not really. So here in New Zealand, we've got the minimum wage and we've got a livable wage. So the, wow. while the minimum wage is $20, the livable wage could be $23 to $30. It's uh, the wage rate where you can live a comfortable life. Uh, we pay rent and uh, it's paid weekly. So if you're a single person, you can just pay for a room in someone's house. That's $150 a week. And that's mm -hmm. including... Uh, power and internet. So you would be paying anywhere between $180 to $200. If you're earning $20, you'd be uh, $20 an hour, you'd be earning between $800, well, $600 to $800 a week. But that money can quickly go if when you have your tax uh, deducted, mm. you have your rent and all of those things deducted you'd be left with a bare minimum for food. And as we know, when we come overseas, we still have a lot of family and uh, commitments we need to support in Fiji. So when even that comes off, there's very yeah. little that, uh, that uh, we have left. So although the $20 looks very lucrative, the standard of life doesn't change. Like if you're working in Fiji and working as a baker, the life that you live, would be equivalent to earning $20 here in New Zealand. Yes, that's right. And that's such a great point. And I hope that resonates with some viewers. You mentioned the better word. I used elaborate lifestyle, but the word is comfortable. Because when we go overseas, we don't want to be struggling again. You know, the whole idea is that we go to get a better quality of life, Again, we talk, have to talk about education, think about extracurricular activities if you have children, and we'd love to travel. So all of those things require consideration, don't they, Rossi? When just touch on very briefly before we wrap up, you know, in terms of being skilled, you know, because I'm just thinking, okay, if we be skilled, at least that will help you get a better job. You know, your husband started as a baker. Has he, is he still in that industry or has he now moved out? He definitely does not work as a baker anymore. He couldn't wait to leave the job. Although he had uh, studied, um, uh, it's a certificate for an APTC, yeah. an Australian uh, uh, tertiary institute that right. trains in Fiji. But what they actually learned there and the experience that he had through his practical in Fiji is very different to what he experienced as of a baker in New Zealand. Uh, Fiji uses scratch baking, which is uh, like mixing your flour right from the beginning right to the end product. But uh, here, most of it is either pre-mixed. There's different types of machines. There's a machine for every single task. And then the products itself, the ingredients, uh, have different names. Uh, although, like, I think in Fiji is uh, something like an example I can quickly use is how we everyone calls it a Colgate. But it's not a Colgate, it's a toothpaste. Eh? Colgate is a brand. So it's uh, similar here. Uh, you might think that custard is custard, but it's called something else. And, and uh, he was quite lost and he didn't enjoy his baking experience, but he had to stay in the job because he needed to. Uh, and uh, like they would use butter in Fiji, but here the butter is like slabs of um, 50 pounds and it takes time to, to yeah. come and relearn again. And he, yeah. he sort of has to relearn all over again. But it's just the skills that he has. And yeah. everything else, the, the ingredients and the process was very, very different. And not to mention yeah. all the products that he had learned, he, apart from bread, I think, which he came to do here, they were all new. The, like the savories and the sweets here are yeah. uh, yeah. things that he has never learned. So it was, it was like being a baker all over again, uh, a yeah. brand new baker all over again. 
Yes, that's such a great story because we need to keep in mind when we talk about skill, like being intentional in preparing ourselves in the skill, you know, before we move across. And if it's a baker, keeping in mind that the name might be the same, but processes might be different. The details are different. So let's not go into these blindly. I mean, Rossi, we have to finish our conversation off this evening, but we've got part two coming up where we really want to hear more about from a family perspective and how you settled in. But thank you for your time this, this evening. And thank you, viewers. Don't forget next week at 8 p.m. exclusively on my TV. And let's continue this conversation with Rossi Milano. Life with Liliana and Friends.